Excellent. Okay, our next keynote speaker is, um, I'm very fortunate to have uh, met Rudy uh, Mazzocchi through Renee Eigenberger, the chairman of Viva Capital, very recently. We'll just click to uh, his uh, presentation. Indeed, and uh, Rudy is um, a friend of Renee's. They worked together in Renee's venture fund many years ago and have stayed in, in contact. And Rudy is just a serial, serial business builder. Uh, his ecosystem is health. I asked him to share that because it is very rare, unusual, and unique to find somebody who has had such repeated success uh, building businesses in different parts of an ecosystem, and I found it to be um, too fascinating to let go, so I've been lobbying for quite some time to get him on stage. Would you please welcome Rudy Mazzocchi to the stage? Thank you very much. Maybe a clicker. Yep. Thank you. No, thank you, Julie and Renee. It's been a pleasure to be here, and one thing I think you asked me, because I don't think I was not known to many of you until about Sunday evening, and now I have multiple new friends in the audience. So as I introduce my, my background and myself and my entrepreneurial journey, my apologies for some of the redundancies. We've had some great conversations over the last two and a half days. It's a wonderful, amazing conference, and I think this makes it a lot easier for us up, up on stage here today. And then I'm going to talk about my entrepreneurial journey through my career as a med tech biotech, um, serial CEO, startup CEO, and then I'm going to convince Dennis how and where I play in the future of, of healthcare, okay? So starting with my, uh, other way, green, green. So my favorite topic. Okay. Um, so I've again, again as, as a serial entrepreneur, I've been a startup CEO. I'm sort of classified as an inventor, designer. I have a background in biochemistry and biophysics. Uh, I took some time off to be a venture capitalist, which was an interesting experience. Went back into the operating side of the business. And I'm also, uh, I have several novels out there and a book that I'll talk about briefly at the end, but a award-winning author. So it's been a really fun, increasing, wonderful career, but I've loved the label. The best one is technology whore. I'm sorry about the language. But I've been introduced many times as a technology whore because I do love technology. You're often told don't fall in love with the technology, but it's a weakness of mine, but it's helped me develop a very interesting and longstanding career. So again, in summary, I've been a founder, co-founder of over 15 companies. I've been chairman of 10. Um, director and advisor of 17. I'm still currently involved as executive chairman of several companies. I've raised the hard way over 650 million in, in seed and early stage capital. So this is seed series A and B capital. Uh, I've had five acquisitions, um, several IPOs, and several mergers. And now I've just actually filed my 111th patent so I've been, I love working with engineers, bioengineers, mechanical engineers, finding solutions and actually working through that patent process. So this is my face of an entrepreneur. <laughs> that little child looked great, but this is really, <laughs> it does take, it is a lifestyle change. It is a lifestyle commitment. It takes a pound of flesh and it does, but I think I look pretty good for 35 <laughs> right now. But, um, been fortunate be, through my career, I've touched on every, almost every element of the human body. I started my first company in Minnesota in cardiology, went into interventional radiology. I've had two startups in the biotech, uh, biopharma area. Um, went into orthopedics and then took, as I mentioned, a couple years off in Atlanta, Georgia. We had a, a, a startup venture capital fund uh, and a, it was called the Innovation Factory. We actually funded 17 companies. Uh, created those companies from the ground up, and then realized that uh, I'm probably not the best venture capitalist. Every, as I told many of you, any, everything that came across my desk I thought I should do or could do. I can fix it. I can make that work. That's not a good venture capitalist. So I went back into the operating side of the business in neurology and neurosurgery, um, recently in ophthalmology, and most currently in plastics, uh, plastic surgery and aesthetics. So I'll touch on some of that as well. But 
as a more final introduction here too, I've been ranked as one of the top entrepreneurs in healthcare in the US. This is I think two years ago, so it's probably changed. But this is a great list of entrepreneurs that uh, I was pleased to find myself on the top. I don't know how they figured that out, but there I was. And I received the Technology Leadership Award uh, several years ago, and the Global Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and for whatever it's worth, twice the Entrepreneur of the Year uh, by Ernst & Young. So how did that all happen? Um, I, I had a long-standing history in transforming medi many medical procedures in healthcare since the late 80s. I have to say my first company I started was 1989. I think I was 28 years old. And fortunately had the ability to touch on very challenging medical procedures. And I just want to give you an idea, and it's just sort of fun to walk through this. So back in the 80s in, in cardiology, the state of the standard care for doing bypass surgery, if you have a heart attack and you had a diseased coronary artery, was basically to put the body on a heart-lung machine, stop the heart, take a vein graft, take a vein out of your leg, and basically sew it onto the surface of the heart. This is called coronary bypass. So through our involvement, the complication rates were very high. Again, these are you know, 15, 12 to 17% complications. Mortality rate, death rate, was about 6.8%. So going from a heart attack to the surgical procedure, you had a high probability of even not surviving the surgery. So with good engineering, I, we had, this is my first company, Mike Ravina, we developed a whole series of uh, technology and devices. You're all now familiar with coronary angioplasty when they put a balloon inside your, your heart and your vessels, dilate the vessel and put a, a stent or a scaffolding. So I have several patents in this area. We developed some of the first technologies and I saw the creation of the first catheterization lab, cath lab. So this actually evolved in, uh, to reduce procedure rates down to 1.2%. But we drove the economics of the procedures. So look, we reduced the hospital stay from four to seven days to probably less than one day. So now this is the new s standard of care in, in cardiology. Very similar, we had a discussion about cerebral aneurysm. So an aneurysm is a ballooning uh, in, the heart, in the vessel, you can see here it's a little balloon on the vessel wall. It's just a weakness in the wall. And if that ruptures in your brain, you probably have minutes to survive. And once it's diagnosed, historically what they would do is open your skull, a craniotomy, wade through your brain tissue, find the vessel, and clip it. That's a little metallic clip that clips the aneurysm to close it. So it, once again, mortality rates here were almost you know, 31%. You had a 31% chance of not surviving the surgery as they wade through your brain tissue to find that vessel and clip it. So once again, we took, you know, base, this is really, I hate to say it's simple, but it's a mechanical engineering solution to now, instead of opening the brain, the idea was to do minimally invasive procedures and go from the groin, where they do a stick, just like the coronary angioplasty, put a guide wire and catheter all the way up into the brain find the opening of that balloon and the vessel and fill it with a material to embolize it. So this has the same effect of, as clipping. And here we reduce the, uh, the mortality rate down to 10%. But more importantly too, is we reduce surgical time. The OR time, the, the, the time of recovery was accelerated. So actually changed that complete industry. I went then into neurosurgery. We had a company, it was image guided surgery and this was the early stages of deep brain neurostimulation. They're actually putting a pacemaker deep into the brain to treat Parkinson's or Parkinson's disease essential tremors. And the idea here was, is very complicated. You had to have a stereotactic head frame. So to do the surgical procedure, the patient had to be off their meds and they had these tremors, right? So they would have to be off their meds in order to identify the location of where the electrode should go deep into the brain. These are actual images. So the patient is awake. Stereotactic frame is bolted to their head, which is then bolted to the table. And then they sort of go fishing with microelectrodes to find the location in the brain that's misfiring. So it's a very, very complicated procedure and it took basically eight to 11 hours. So that patient is bolted to the table for over eight hours, talking to the surgeon, and then when they find the location, their tremors stop. That's why they have to physically see the tremor 
and they hit the spot that stops and everyone applauds and say, that's it, we put the pacemaker in there and we close. But again, it's an open surgical procedure, open brain. So we developed a less invasive approach using what I, I label a disposable GPS system for the neurosurgeon. Okay, so this is all plastic, all disposable. So you could actually do this in the, in the bore of a magnet, an MRI scanner, to visualize in real time as you go to the target. So we eliminated the stereotactic head frame. We came up with a way of tracking. This, again, image-guided surgery. And this was the system we used through a three millimeter twist drill hole. So instead of an eight by eight centimeter craniotomy, it was a three millimeter hole we went down through. And this was acquired by Medtronic, who was the market leader in deep brain neurostimulation. Quickly, I'm just giving you some ideas of where those patents went and what I've been doing for the last 25 years. In orthopedics, um, many of you may have had knee problems. If you have an ACL uh, damage, there was an open surgical procedure. This is actually still pretty standard, state of the art. But we moved it then to arthroscopic surgery. Many of you may have had some of the arthroscopic procedures. But again, less invasive. We, we drove the economics of this procedure. And now you can go to a special procedure lab and have this done and walk out the next day and hit the slopes two or three days later. Last one in ophthalmology. Um, if you're familiar, I don't know if many of you have had have relatives, maybe parents or grandparents that had cataracts. I think they call it stars in Europe and German. So this is when 70% of us over the age of 70, our lens, the natural lens inside our eye becomes cloudy and rigid. So it doesn't focus very well, it's very cloudy. So, and this is the, the white lens you see in the capsule there. Centuries ago, all they did was took a sharp object and pushed that lens into the back of the eye and it would drop into the eye. And you didn't have any good focal vision, but at least it wasn't cloudy. You can see people approaching. So that's where it stemmed from, cataract surgery. And today, the standard now is you can go in through a two, two millimeter incision on the side of your eye, get to that cloudy lens. We use ultrasonic, uh, it's called phaco emulsification, to dissolve the lens, aspirate it out, and insert an acrylic lens. So there are 28 million procedures done a year in the US in cataract surgery alone. It's one of the number one procedures. It takes 12 to 15 minutes now. But that acrylic lens, once it's inserted, gives you 20-20 good long, long distance vision. But you still have to re use your readers, your glasses, for your computer screen or for near vision. What we've developed, this is a company called Elenza. This is an electroactive lens. So it's all about material science. Again, I don't want to downplay it, but this, to me, this is simple. This is electro, you know, mechanical engineering at its best. So we have developed a lens, an implantable lens that goes behind your pupil. It has a, a it's a liquid crystal lens that auto focuses. So on board we have two microprocessors. This is a nine millimeter lens. On board processors, two rechargeable power cells. They originally came out of Switzerland. They, came out of my watch probably, is a one millimeter rechargeable battery. We now use a solid state ceramic battery. It's recharged through a sleeping pillow. We have to, we, it's, a, it's called inductive recharging. It has a photovoltaic cell. So we're, the triggering mechanism, so when we look far, our pupils dilate. When we look near, they constrict. And it's a linear movement. And there's algorithms on the, on the processor here that knows when we're looking far, intermediate, or near. And it sends an electrical current to this liquid crystal, very similar to the liquid crystals you've seen in Windows, where you hit a switch and they go dark. It's just, all we're doing is looking at changing the molecular reorientation of the, of the crystal itself. But instead of going light or dark, we're changing the power of the lens. So the wonderful the beauty of this technology, and this is just the beginning. So this is designed for perfect vision, autofocusing vision, just like the autofocusing lens on your camera. We can also do a zoom. We can do a four to eight X zoom. So I can do a double blink and I can zoom in on Renee and see his wonderful tan. Or there's an ability here now because of the capacity of these chips, we can actually capture data. I can do a blink and capture a photograph and send it to my phone. So it's taking that hollow lens approach into 
is an implantable lens, a smart lens technology. So again, don't ever overemphasize it, but this is what I've been doing for the last 25 years. To me, this is straightforward and I don't want to say simple, but with good engineers, and I'm not an engineer, but I, I build a great team of engineering around me. This is how I've sort of been successful in this markets place. But what's next? You know, that, that's worrisome. I think that some days I wake up and I said, what, what else can we do? I mean, it's been, I can fix these mechanical solutions, but the world is moving quickly. And healthcare, unfortunately, is decades behind the rest of the technology probably sitting in this room. So, but now, even today, and it sounds cliche and it's a little dated, but healthcare is, is now digital. So we can do self-diagnosis, right? We have, uh, doctors can communicate remotely, and, but it's not timely yet, and I'm gonna tell you why. In medication on demand, I can go online and order just about any medication off and on prescription. And then data is so empowering now too. We can, we're looking at more preventative healthcare, drug discovery and development. So it's all about data, but the buzzwords now today are personalized patient-specific care. It's all about my specific patient-specific uh, procedural data, genomics. Uh, the FDA is also talking, we've gone from clinical validation to evidence-based medicine and uh, healthcare and wellness and tel telehealth. It's really about teleimaging, which I'm going to explain. So obvious, and again, this is probably old news to most of you in the room, but in healthcare, this is now the big issues, big data. And how do we transform that, that, that volume to value-based healthcare? Most of us, if we go to the hospital and, and have a procedure done or a diagnosis, there are terabytes of data based on us specifically. Everything from our, just our medical records, our medical history, to the imaging that takes place to get a diagnosis or a therapy. So, I've had to sort of evolve as an old school designer of medical devices. I had to learn, thanks to many of you here, what is artificial intelligence, machine learning, block, I'm still trying to figure out blockchain technology, how it might adapt here. And cloud computing now is becoming a major issue in healthcare because of the volume of data that we're being collected on a, on a daily basis. So now I have to combine, as an entrepreneur, we have to combine all these items. But the challenge too is that we have security issues, major security issues. This is where most hacking is done. Medical records, if you think about it, if you have, someone gets access to our medical records, it's almost worse than getting access to my visa uh, or credit information. And then there's regulatory issues that, may, that even complicate this further on how to control the flow of data. So in the environment in the hospitals today, there's enormous amount of rich content and data, but we don't have the processing power, the cost of these uh, computers, hard drives, and servers in the hospital is, is enormous. And we don't have the bandwidth. And I cannot share data easily I can't, if I, were, if I were a radiologist to share in New York City to share it with another expert radiologist in Algiers, it would be nearly impossible. It would take days to get that data. If I wanted to get an MRI scan of my wife's brain, it would take me three to four days to get our own data. It's so restricted. So streaming, with, you know, we have streaming. We have four members of our family could be in the same house look, streaming live videos from Netflix, watching four different movies, but we can't do that in healthcare. And it's a little bit, uh, it's basically embarrassing and it's unfortunate and it's restrictive. So within one hospital, for me to share data, if I were, if I were a neurosurgeon and I wanted to get data from a patient of mine, from the x-rays or the MR scans that took place in the emergency room, it would take me at least 25 to 28 minutes. And it's mainly because, again, of these requirements, HIPAA, which is a health insurance portability and uh, accountability, and then all these regulations on, on patient privacy, which we want, right? We want that privacy, but it burdens the whole system. So in gaming, you can have th hundreds of people interacting real time in a game, but in, in the hospital, it's isolated. We're prevented, we can't even share data to a sister affiliate hospital across the city. It would take us literally a day or two to share that data. So, 
the problem here too is the internet leaders are, are ready to you know, capture this data, but who's gonna trust? So this is Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Samsung, Facebook, IBM. So you, we're not, we don't wanna trust these, in, these leading firms to manage our data. And the issue here too is that we have now a growing adoption of electronic health records. These are the massive records that govern all of our health care for each one of us individually. But there's shortcomings. It's not, there's no interoperability. It's hard to sort of do data analytics. And we, we want to now compare outcomes of procedures from an economics perspective. So it's left to the entrepreneur. You know, that's, you know, we got to go figure that out. So our, we have a company we've started um, based on imaging. So imaging is core to all medicine. Pro 95 percent probability when you go for your care anywhere, you're going to get an x-ray, an ultrasound, an MR scan, a CT scan. This is what builds that multi-terabytes of data in healthcare. And the, and the issues today is this current landscape, this architecture is archaic. We're still using, you know, these old operating systems. The hardwares are very cumbersome. They're expensive. There's weak data security. And there's even bandwidth limitations. You know, we can't communicate. How do I communicate with that, that hospital in Algiers with, a, with Stanford University? It's nearly impossible. So there's a company we form that's called Biomedics. And the original um, product design here was we were looking at medical simulation. We have our own 3D physics engine to capture clinical data and procedural data to simulate nearly an endless number of surgical procedures, not only for training purposes, but it gives the surgeon a way to do pre-surgical planning. So we started with reconstructive facial surgery. We actually have a relationship with Boston Children's Hospital where we can look at reconstructing children's faces that have born with cleft palate or cleft lip, and we can simulate the procedure and the potential outcomes. So the surgeon can actually practice on a 3D holographic image of the patient, experiment with maybe 30 different types of medical techniques and procedures to see which one would give him the best outcome. And then they can share it with the, with the parents of the, of the child. And that's the most scary time, if you can imagine having a child that's born with an abnormality, a cleft palate, to share that with them and show them, this is what I'm gonna do, this is gonna be the outcomes, because they're scared to death, they don't have any idea of how the outcome is going to be perceived. So this drove many demands. We wanted to do this in real time, so we had all this enormous amount of you know, 70, 80 gigabytes of data, and we wanted to drive a simulation using a physics engine in real time. But there are issues. We wanted something that had no processing power limitations. We needed to do that computational in speed in real time. Um, we wanted to minimize costs, because this is a consultation tool at first, a pre-surgical planning tool, and then we're moving into what we call augmented guided surgery and we didn't want any bandwidth limitations. So we built our own medical imaging cloud. And there's nothing like, I think this is the most disruptive thing in healthcare coming, because this is streaming now in, in, in healthcare. So this is at the core. So we've virtualized all of our software. We have a configuration of software which we, resides in our proprietary cloud. It's a layer two point to point uh, cloud computing. It's like the expressway. This is 60 times faster than Amazon Web Services, 20 times faster than a T1 line, because we're pushing 50 kilos of sand through a tiny keyhole. So we're uploading data now. This is your MRI, CT, X-ray, uh, even including the integration of your electronic health records. Pushing that to the cloud, we can do that within two minutes. Any other system today takes again, 25 minutes to an hour to upload the data. And then what we do is broadcast the data in pixels to any device. We can broadcast to your cell phone, your tablet, your PC in less than two to three seconds now. So this is gonna change healthcare because of our ability. And this, this has a huge impact from telehealth because now I can push data and share it with that person in Algiers within seconds on his cell phone. Because the data doesn't leave the cloud, That's an, so it's highly secure. So we push all the data, it resides there, and then we just broadcast to any, any unlimited number of users. So this is gaming now uh, to multiple users, with surgeons and radiologists and health 
healthcare individual. So this now is the new architecture. And again, the key is the virtualization of all the software, cloud-based, it's device agnostic. We have no bandwidth issues. So it doesn't matter what kind of bandwidth requirement, what they have in Algiers, we'll get, he's gonna get the same data in real time transmitted from New York or, or, or San Francisco. So now what can we do? Process and analyze data in real time. So now I don't have to wait. Is that neurosurgeon, I don't have to wait 28 minutes for the radiologist to give me that data. As he receives it and annotates and gives me it, the outcomes, I'm looking at it on my cell phone. I can be in my car or at dinner looking at that data in real time. Immediate sharing and referrals. This is an, inter this is an actual case. This is an MRI of a patient and this is going to be an idea of how this is going to be optimized now. That, that white image on the left-hand side, the neurologist and the radiologist viewed it as a brain tumor. An hour later, the neurosurgeon received it and he said, that's not a brain tumor, that's a hemorrhagic bleed. It's a bleed inside the brain. Completely different therapy, different approach, different surgical care. This patient almost went to a floor to look at getting chemotherapy for his brain tumor. If they waited another hour, this patient would have died because of the hemorrhagic bleed. So this immediate sharing and referral in real time is going to impact people's lives and surgical procedures. And then telehealth. We all talk about telehealth, um, sharing data, looking at experts in Algiers, talking to Stanford University once again. Now we can actually do this in real time. Don't forget, we're broadcasting that data, that image, in real time to an unlimited number of users wherever they are in the world. And no one can currently do that today. And then lastly, augmented guided surgery. And you know, we've had multiple discussions about augmented reality, but here now because of our ability to upload terabytes of data in real time, we can do augmented guided surgery, not image guided, augmented guided. So here we're looking at using an AR visor in the operating room. The surgeon now has access to an unlimited amount of data, x-ray, MR, CT, health records, and with the projection capability of AR, with a foot pedal or a fob, he can be looking at a surgical case, let's call it a brain tumor, and he can overlay either right on the patient or adjacent to the patient a holographic image of the data. Give me the coronal view of an MRI. Okay, show me the sagittal view. Show me the CT scan. Give me the facial scan. So it's giving him a roadmap, and it's all about now eyes on patient rather than looking at the monitors. So this now all becomes feasible, and it's gonna change the, our paradigm. So this. I know this is futuristic, but this is coming. This is now, the capabilities are here. And again, we've been decades behind all the other beautiful industries in this room until I think this cloud imaging uh, possibility here as well. Okay? So, I know it's a lot <laughs> to digest right after breakfast, but thank you very much. And then here, I do have a, since you mentioned your book, right? So this is my, I have a, top selling, it's a business book, it's called Storytelling, The Indispensable Art of Entrepreneurism. When I received my third Entrepreneur of the Year Award, they came, Ernst & Young said, what's your secret? And I thought, I have no business training. I said, I think I tell a good story. You know, I tell it to investors, that story has to change, I recruit my team, you know, we talk about the exit, so my story is always evolving. And they said, so they commissioned me to write this book called Storytelling. Um, and then here are my three novels, and I'm only, <laughs> I'm only bringing these up because these capture, these are medical thrillers, they capture a lot of the medical technology that I've been privileged to see that are sometimes 10, 20 years away from commercialization. And I just always ask myself, what if? What if we, this, really com this technology comes to be, as I just mentioned, some of it, it has political, social, and, and you know, ethical issues that we have to deal with, society has to, to deal with. So, one's becoming a film, Equity of Evil is coming a film, but I just wanted to touch on that and introduce you to that opportunity as well. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a seat. Thank you. Fantastic, wow. Um, <laughs> I so want you in charge of my health care. <laughs> I just, uh, how do I commission you? That's the model here. Um, that, that was absolutely fascinating because a couple of things, um, if we could just have quiet, 
if we could just have quiet in the room so that people can hear um, Rudy while we have him on stage. Um, I mean, is the body becoming a platform? And, and is this the next disruptive technology that you know something absolutely radical is about to be discovered because what you're talking about is slow, slow, slow. So is there a big breakthrough about to happen or has it happened and you're just one of the few people that knows about this and <laughs> do tell us if you know? Yeah. No, I think it's, it's slow and it's gonna continue to be slow. I think okay. the regulatory requirements in getting these technologies approved, this is one of the most regulated areas of industries, right, with high levels of compliance. Mm -hmm. And things have actually gotten harder for medical devices. The clinic, the bar for doing clinical validation and to, to drive it to the market is very, very high. It used to be, in the day when I started these companies, I can t bring a product to market three, four, five million. Today, with the regulatory requirements, it, that's tripled. And some venture investors say it's almost equal to getting a drug approved. You know, medical devices used to be the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. So it's not getting any easier, I think, but technology is advancing so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, real quick story, you know, I was executive chairman of a breast implant company I've talked to many of you about in Costa Rica. And I wasn't enamored about being in the breast implant business, although it was interesting. Um, but they had biosensors that were embedded in the implant. And those biosensors could give an early indication of breast cancer and because of the logistics of where these implants were, we had acoustical sensors that can measure cardiac output and pulmonary function. That's all great, but it's gonna take a decade to validate mm -hmm. and get approved. Mm -hmm. So yes, the human body is a great platform for technology, but the bar is still very, very high on getting commercial approval. So two questions uh, on, on that, and then I'm aware that there's probably questions in the, in the audiences for you. There's a kind of implicit um, U.S. regulatory framework. In every other industry, we see that that's um, shifting or being you know, fought over in terms of who's deciding the protocols and the standards, and the U.S. can't just control, you know, and so forth. So how much longer do you think there's going to be this hegemony, you know, the United States through the FDA or whatever determines the regulatory framework? Yeah, well, there's still, again, the I hate to use that term, but the bar is set high by the U.S. FDA. Um, we used to, in the day when I was developing these technologies, come to Europe because of the, sort of the relaxed environment for clinical trials. The lens that I mentioned, the autofocusing lens inside the eye, to get that CE marked here in Europe, we have to do 60 patients, follow them for six months. Mm -hmm. In the US, it's 1,000 patients and we follow for two years. Mm -hmm. So the, the, just the pure capital requirement there is severe. I mean, you're talking 18 to 20 million in the US clinical trial, maybe three to five million in Europe. Right. So, and we can only use a portion of that data for right. FDA. Right. And CE mark approval is, is becoming more, it's changing too. The requirements are becoming almost equivalent now to the FDA. Mm -hmm. So it's a very challenging market. That's why I think investors are reluctant to get into this med tech, medical technology because of the timeline mm -hmm. and the capital intensity. Uh, you know, there's um, many private equity and venture capital investors who you're, you're just a dream. I mean, you know, they're looking for you. They're looking for the guy who can build the businesses and take whatever was done and the first five million that went in and make something of it. Um, how do you decide which companies to get involved with? And how do you decide, more importantly, which financiers and capital providers you want to do business with? Because just like they're trying to find you, you don't want to end up with the wrong one. Uh, right. Some guy who has absolutely no empathy understanding. Great. Yeah. No, the first question is easy, right? Um, I'm always looking for transformational technology, and now I'm sort of using a new term of disruptive. I'm sort of learning what disruptive really means. Mm -hmm. So I, I can pick and choose. And there, it's a small industry, mm -hmm. really. Um, the investor group is actually smaller. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have a, I don't know if anybody remembers a Rolodex. Remember the Rolodex? <laughs> I used to yeah. have a Rolodex of about 60 go-to VCs in medical device and med tech. Today, it's probably 12 to 15. Wow. So it's really, and everyone now, as is, is, is we know, in the last 10 years have gone from early stage investments to growth funding. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. I'm actually, it's very difficult to find that right mm -hmm. investor mm -hmm. that's willing to partner with me to do seed or Series A yep. investment financing. Yep. 
So I keep going back to the same well many times or those that I've made money for, mm -hmm. uh, but I can only do that so many times. So I'm always looking for fresh new investors that may want to get into this industry. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any questions for Rudy? Yes, please, Taro. So Taro is super interesting. It's the first time that he's joined us at the FTE. He's come in from Tokyo and yeah. he's a venture capitalist. Hi. I'm, I'm Taro from Japan. Um, using your medical, new medical uh, imaging cloud, uh, how do you see the possibility to develop new solution coming out um, for Alzheimer's disease? Oh. That's a good question. I don't know, I haven't thought about the disease state in particular. But again, it's all start, so we designed this for imaging, right? So with, with Alzheimer's, you, you do, there's functional MRI, there's MRI imaging. So I think just capturing that data and then interfacing, and that's what we're trying to do is partner with big imaging companies like Philips and um, GE and um, Siemens. So we want to partner with those companies to help drive this into their marketplace, but also big pharma. So we've learned it, pharma, you know, because there's a lot of pharmaceutical agents now that are going inter to interact with the imaging to identify targets. It may be neurostimulation, it may be drug related, but I think the, the solution starts with a diagnosis and then analyzing the therapeutic effect. So I think it's unlimited right now. I think all these disease states can be managed and benefit from a cloud computing, is, is this, uh, this capability. Thank you. I, actually, one of my, one of my uh, portfolio companies is working on that, so let me follow up on that. Excellent. Oh, very good. Wonderful. Thank you. Another question. So, um, you know, as, as, oh, please. Yes, Hugh. Hugh, right there in the front row, man with sunglasses, but not on. <laughs> I was very interested in that lens uh, with the battery and the CPU. That struck me as being really uh, quite uh, revolutionary, potentially. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, William Gibson predicted something like this many years ago in a, in, in, in a cyberpunk book, so science fiction, and it's sort of becoming clearly reality. That's very interesting to see. Um, I, I guess it's being sort of suggested to use that for people who have you know, problems with their vision. Um, but with these kinds of things, eventually you gain the potential to actually surpass what, what healthy people can do. And, and is, that, is that something that you foresee um, as, as a possibility in this, in this case? Yeah, no, great question. Absolutely. So cataract surgery, like I said, 70% of us will have cataracts. But there's now something called a clear lens exchange. Mm. So it, I can't use myself, my age as an example, but a 40-year-old is severely myopic you know, really thick glass, they can elect to have their, their natural lens exchanged with an acrylic lens. And the, the purpose of doing, but you have to pay out of pocket for that. That might be uh, $6,000 per eye. Cataract surgery is reimbursed in the US, it's reimbursed uh, across the country. But eventually, for military applications, there's many applications I think that are gonna opt in to have their lens replaced to give you that kind of capability zoom lens, taking photographs, video clips. Um, if you're a golfer, I mean, this would be an ideal lens to have, right? You can do a zoom, you can look at, you know, maybe give you a distance indicator on a heads-up display. It'll, it'll auto-focus when you look down to the, when you're teeing off. Um, so based on your lifestyle and desired quality of life, you may opt to have that lens put in. Yeah, I mean, Gibson suggested that um, reality TV stars and essentially what, he, what would have been called now Instagram influencers, but they didn't have that back then. But you know, he suggested that those kinds of people would, you know, use this because they would uh, they would want to record what they were doing. And absolutely, and, yeah. Well, we did one final comment. We had um, we talked to the venture arm of the CIA, <laughs> and their one question is: Is there enough capacity on that chip to upload facial recognition software? <laughs> oh and we dear. said yes, there is. <laughs> Okay. Is there another question uh, for Rudy? Um, there we go in the back. Thanks. Hi, Rudy. John Nyswander. Um, I look at a lot of pitches from European healthcare startups, and one of the big um, tensions is always between the impact of this technology, but also who's going to end up paying for this technology? Who's the end customer? 
who saves money? Is the insurance companies going to save money? Hospitals? How do you balance that in your own mind between a disruptive technology and actually just making cash? Well, you know, another great question. That, that's, that's sort of out of our control. It's driven now, even in the U.S., uh, to do a clinical study for regulatory approval, for FDA approval, is one type of clinical validation study. For reimbursement now, it's a separate parallel study. You can try to combine them. But Medicare, Medicaid, the, the third-party insurance providers want to see that evidence that it's cost-effective. So we try the best we can in combining those clinical outcomes in our clinical study, but many times we have to do a separate parallel study to show the, you know, the analytics behind driving the economics. We have to prove that it's economical. Um, we've had several challenges where it was a patient pay model. There was no reimbursement. So we spent a lot of time developing a product just to ensure that the consumer, that patient, can afford to pay for it out of pocket. So when did you know that you were going to be uh, a doctor and a healthcare professional and an entrepreneur in this space? When did, was that four years old, 12 years old, 24 years old? When did this happen? Uh, I think well, I was in grad school at UCLA. And uh, I have a background in working in one of the first genetic engineering labs as well. Wow. But when I was at UCLA, I was tasked with developing an implantable enzyme bioreactor mm -hmm. um, with a great team. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I put my f name to my first patent. Wow. And I fell in love with the fact that I can design something and play with it, see a patent, and then work with physicians and patients to, to provide an outcome. Is uh, writing therapeutic? Does it help you consolidate? Does it help you to think and become a better entrepreneur? What's the interaction between the two? Yes, yeah, all of the above, but it keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so when I travel, I don't go down to the lobby bar and start, you know, so I, I stay in my room <laughs> and I write. But I always say, every, I think there's a novel in every one of us. So it's, um, it's, it's been a, a wonderful pastime, a hobby for me, and a, a creative outlet. Well, your books are, are, are absolutely fantastic and really riveting. I can't recommend them enough. I, I would start with the, 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 the storytelling book. That was the one that I read um, over Easter, which is really fantastic. Um, and I, I, do we have one last question for Rudy? I'm sure you, he'll be with us, of course. I, I just thank you so much uh, for you and Caroline coming over from New York because it is really extraordinary what you've done and achieved and, and are continuing to do, and we look forward to, to working with you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please thank Rudy for his insights and his inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.